Amen. Amen. You may be seated. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Take your Bibles, your phone, or whatever, and uh, we're going to put it together. Today we're going to talk about how love changes our motivation. Love changes our motivation. Hey, Angie. We've seen the love of God in Lauren Worley's life. And thank you for allowing us. You've been sharing that. You, you one kind of pricked our hearts. Praise God. We've watched this week. We continue to watch him change her life and her family. I mean, already believers, already a part of a church family at Grace up in Stewart. But praise God for what we're seeing. And he's not done with you. He's not done with me either. Amen? I mean, we've been in this series, 1 Corinthians 13, talking about love and life over the last four weeks, finishing up today. And really, we're going to take an overview of what 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is. This is the love chapter, if you will. And, and there are three different kinds of love, if you may remember this. There are three different kinds of love throughout Scripture. There's eros, phileo, and agape. Eros love is the love you have in a relationship. It's more of the erotic, more of the uh, husband and a wife, boyfriend, girlfriend kind of love. But realize that's one of those things. Praise God for that love. Anybody want to say amen? Amen. No, we're going to talk about that another day. Phileo is the next one, kind of like the Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. So phileo is brotherly love. It's, it's what we have for family members. It's what we have for those people that are close to us that we have an affinity or an affection for because you have st stolen my heart or we've become to walk together. And the last one is the agape love. Throughout the scripture, we see all of these talked about. But here specifically in 1 Corinthians 13, and when we hear about the love of God, it's agape love. Say agape. agape. If, you, if you've ever been to Emmaus, agape is a word that we use a lot. We'll have to talk more about that another day. But I want you to understand that God loves you so much that it is unbreakable, unconditional, not based on anything you have done, will do, or even can do. God loves you in spite of yourself. I mean, that's really, Tracy, what you just said a minute ago. I can accept my past because he says I'm loved, just like the song just said. I want us to understand today, through this series, we've studied how love makes us more compassionate. We look at people and see them the way God does. We, we've talked about how the character traits of love should be a part of our relationships, like our marriages. We looked at that Valentine's weekend. We also, last week, talked about how love changes our lives or molds our lives more and more, changing us to be more like Jesus. And today, I want to take this look about how how love is not just shaping us, but it motivates us to love others. Or it motivates us to understand the love of God. In fact, God said it like this. We shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You've heard that say amen? amen. And then he said, I want the second one, similar to it, is love your neighbor as yourself. Do you have a trouble? Do you have any trouble loving your neighbor? I don't know. That guy that lives on my right. Mm. Now, the one on the left, she okay. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? We can't pick and choose who we love. He says love everybody. He didn't say like them. <laughs> That's, you know, don't quote that one, okay? Jesus does all these things for us. He loves me in spite of myself. He takes us as I am. I want you to understand. I need us to understand today that the way that God loves us ought to motivate us to love others. Amen? Amen. These verses, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, teach us how God loves us and then how we're to love others. Stand with me, and we're going to read this together. I'm going to read out loud. You read silently. It's on the screen. hope you have your Bible. I, I want to give you just a word real quick. One of the reasons why um, you may go to church and you don't get anything out of church is because you don't expect to get anything out of church. Let me tell you just a couple of ways to expect. Number one, pray. God, will you please speak to me today? N number two, bring your Bible. You know, this is the Word of God. We need the Word of God in our lives, okay? And another one, and this is kind of out there, but maybe take notes. Some of you, I, I'm a very, if I'm, if I'm taking notes, I get more of it. So just think about some ways. What are you expecting to get from God today? Here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You listen as I read, follow along. If I could speak with the tongues of men and of angels... But I don't have love or don't love others. I would only be a noisy gong or a, a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and I understood all of God's great secrets, secret plans, and possessed all knowledge, if I had all such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I had to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have nothing or gained nothing. Verse 4, love is patient and kind. 
Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, always hopeful and endures every, through every circumstance. Verse 8, prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, that's Jesus, by the way, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned like a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like fading in a mirror, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. And then we will see everything with perfect clarity. And all that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. These things will last forever, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is Lord Jesus, thank you for this day, this time, for those who have never experienced your love, who are listening or watching or who are interacting with the sermon today. God, I pray that you help us to be know, know we're loved by you and we can be motivated to live this life based upon that love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This is an incredible chapter. I don't know about you, but this chapter teaches me and us a lot. In fact, there's two verses or two chapters that I read a lot at weddings. <laughs> this is one of them. This, and I go back to Ephesians chapter 5. Incredible verses about what love should do or what love is about or how love is couched. I think it's kind of cool when you look in this scripture, this chapter, especially the first couple of verses and then around verses 8 and 9, he talks about the gifts. In chapter 12 and in chapter 14, we have the bookends of love, and he talks to us about the spiritual gifts. You see, if you're a Christian, if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you have been given spiritual gifts. And he's given you those talents or those gifts to use for the church, not for you personally. We, as Michael talked about just a few minutes ago, we're to have corporate prayer time, and that means we pray together. We're to serve this community together, because when you serve all by yourself, you can make a difference. But when we serve together, we can make a bigger difference. Amen? I want you to hear today, he is talking to us about love, because love ought to motivate us to use our spiritual gifts to show others who God is. And love ought to help us look at our neighbors differently, because most of us, we want to look at our neighbors as a judge rather than as a servant. We want to look at somebody as what they don't have or what they don't do for me rather than what God wants to do for them. I want you to understand, I, want, I believe that God wants us today to see three in particular things, okay? Number one, he wants us to see and understand divine love. Divine. I am not talking about your spouse. You may think they're divine, but if you notice, the longer y'all are married, the less divine you think. I, 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 it just seems that because we get in a rut. Can I remind you today, when you got saved, when you accepted Jesus as your, as your Savior, when you realized that your sins were forgiven, what did it do to your heart, your mind, and your soul? Oh, come on, now you just wanted to shout. You wanted to be Pentecostal. Be honest. We, we got excited about it, amen? Come on. I want to remind you today that I won't, I'm not anymore what I used to be, but I'm still not what I'm going to be. Praise God, I am who he made me to be. And there's a day coming that I get to go to heaven. Y'all want to go? Well, Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. I want to remind us that this divine love changes our lives. So let me go through just some verses with you, okay? Here we go. Romans chapter 5, verse number 8, says it this way, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Here's the deal. What, what is he telling us? He's telling us that God showed his love for us by sending us who? Jesus. By Jesus being sent to us, he is for us, and he has forgiven, forgiven our sins. Here's another verse for you, 1 John 4, 16. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love, and God is love, for God is love, and all who live in God, or all who live in love, live in God, and God lives in them. So here's the deal. We trust in the one who loves us most. Well, who are you trusting in today? Hey, focus here. Okay? All right? Sit. <clears throat> I want us to understand, as we trust God, as we see Him, we understand He loves us. 
so much. Am I worthy of that love? Are you worthy of God's love? I, I disagree. I don't believe I'm worthy of anything. Praise God, Jesus makes us worthy. We are worthy based upon his love. We are waste, based upon what he says. Uh, I know I'm worthy only because by myself I'm useless. But by myself I'm lost. But by myself I'm in trouble. By myself I'm going to treat you like Deb told us. I'm going to be bitter, but praise God I've gotten better because I realized I was blessed. Anybody else blessed here today? God is love and God lives. He's alive and well today and he loves you. Listen to Romans 8, 38 through 39. We're talking about divine love. He says, I am convinced, Paul does, I am convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love, not life, nor death, nor angels, nor demons, neither fears for today or worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate you from God's love. No power in the sky above or the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. What can separate you from God's love? you. Let, let me get, get honest with you, okay, for just a second here. I'm not saying that you can separate yourself from God's love, but you can take your thinking, and you can take your acting, and you can take your walking, and you can walk like you don't live in God's love, or that God doesn't love you. You can act like, I've seen some of you act before, you don't act like God's love sometimes. I don't either. Sometimes our words. But how about this? We don't say it out loud very much, but how often do we, are we bombarded with thoughts that aren't lovely? How, how often are we bombarded with, I, I want the, here's what I want you to do to them. Here's what it is. God says, I'm going to motivate you to love and good deeds. The only way to do that is by focusing on who God is. Stay connected to God. I'm convinced that nothing, nothing, nothing separates us from God's love. 1 John 3, 1. Listen, see how very much our Father loves us, for He calls us His children. And that's what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. I am a child of God. Anybody else want to say that with me? I am a child of God. He calls us his children. He calls me his child. And others need to know that. The last couple of days, Julie and I have had the opportunity to be with two of the most greatest and grandest and sweetest and kindest and the only in grandchildren that really matter. The rest of you can talk later, okay? I mean, grandchildren, are, I mean, we know that. But one of the things that I got to do this week, the last couple of days, is um, to get my granddaughter out of bed when she woke up in the morning. I walked up the stairs at our, our daughter's house. Love Ruthie and, 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 and Sean. But those kids they gave us are much better than them. <laughs> I hope you're watching today. <laughs> um, but as I walked up the stairs, I think it was yesterday morning, Harper, who's two years old, was singing up and down, up and, you know, what. I want to tell you, I hadn't heard many angels sing, but I heard an angel sing yesterday. And then I got to pick her up, and she needed a diaper change. That's a different story. Different day. Ah, so I took her to her grandma, Juju. But holding that child in my arms, I picture how God loves us. That's my grandchild. Oh, you, you want to talk about my grandbaby? We talk. We might talk more than talk, you know. That's my baby. Do you know how the Father looks at you? Do you know how the Father wants to hold you? He loves you more than you'll ever know. Nothing can separate you from his love. He calls you his children. Those are my kids. He looks down from heaven. No, he stands right beside you and me. He walks with us and talks with us every day. And I want to continue to do that because he whispers sweet nothings. Not the kind that are, you know, sweet. But they're often often just what I need to hear Michael when you think the deepest and the lowest I want to tell you that I think the highest and the best of you I want to tell you today Michael you may think that you're unlovely and unforgiving that you are forgiven and you are lovely to me do you know what that's what God wants to say to you too why because that's his love Psalms 37, verse number 7. How precious is your unfailing love, O God. All humanity finds shelter in the shadow of your wings. His love is unfailing. How precious it is. Zephaniah 3, 17. For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight 
in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears, and he will rejoice over you with joyful songs. Isn't that awesome? He is our Savior. Amen? He, he delights in us. I love that picture. He delights in us. He calms our fears. What is this divine love about? It is not like our love toward our spouses, toward our kids, or even toward our neighbor. It is a different kind of love that ought to motivate us to love others and to love God back. Here you go, Galatians 2.20. My old self has been crucified with Christ. No longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So the life I now live in this eternal body, or excuse me, earthly body, by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Here's the deal. No longer me. It's him. No longer me. It's him. What, what are you basing your life upon? No longer me, but him. What, what are you basing your self-worth on? No longer me, but him. What, what, what are you basing your future on? No longer me, but him. Everybody good? All right, that's the sermon. Y'all, no, don't get up. Lock the door. Divine love. Here you go. The, the second, the second um, point of this sermon is really profound. Here you go. Do love. <laughs> Real profound. Just do it. Isn't that what Nike said? They gave us a swoosh. Just do it. Here's the deal. Here's what he says to us. Just love. Just go do it. How do you do it? You know what? You don't need a theological degree to do this. You, you don't need to read a huge big book. Just know his book. Here's the deal. We need to know his love. But the way to do it is just to show his love to somebody else. Let me give you some thoughts about his love. Here's how it responds. Love speaks up for somebody else. Love not, not only speaks up for somebody else, but love serves often. Tammy, you, you just spoke about that when we talked about how you've experienced God's love. He's so motivated you so that you can now love others. Sometimes he wants you to slow down and listen. Sometimes he wants you to get up and serve. Why? Why, why are we motivated to love? Or why are we thinking about how we respond to others? It's because our love is empty. That's what he says here in verses 1 through 3. He says, if you have all these things, in fact, if you've got all kinds of money in all the world, and you give it to the poor, and you do things for others, but you don't have the love of God around you, you are just making noise, and you are useless. You know what? You're going to waste, if you're not giving your possessions and your time to serve God... You're wasting your possessions and your time. I, I just let, let's go a little further. If if you're a part of the community fellowship and you aren't giving, you're robbing from God. And by the way, that's showing that you don't love God. And I'm just being honest with you about what Micah says. He says we're robbing God if we don't bring the, our tithe to the storehouse. Well, look at that preacher meddling up there. You know there are all kinds of gifts that he gives us, but there's nothing greater that we could do than to say I love you because God loved me. 1 Corinthians 12, 31. This is a good verse, and I, I want you to think about this. There are some people that have a, a way of looking. You can go ahead and put up the verse. A, a way of looking at life that changes or motivates them to live differently. This is from Paul, and it's right before 1 Corinthians 13. It's the verse right before. He says, so you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts, but now let me show you the way of life that is best of all. You know, the most important people in the church are not necessarily the ones that are up preaching the sermons or singing the songs. Oftentimes, they're the little people that seem to be so insignificant, but they ain't little. What they do, maybe it's cleaning toilets. Maybe it's giving somebody a hug. Maybe it's that little kid in the back that ran up to you when you were keeping the kids and gave you a hug and you felt like your tank was getting full. That's the love of God. You know, you know how many of us are vital to the church? All of us. Do you know how many of us shouldn't be here today? Huh. None of us. We should all be here. <laughs> I want you to understand. Paul said, as I look around, I want you to see and know just how good God is. And what, what does love look like? I, I'm going a little deeper in this chapter 13. Again, he says love is patient. Anybody patient around here? Yeah, you go ahead and pray for patience. Listen to James 5, 7. Dear brothers, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. 
Be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers. Any of y'all farmers? I'm not. If I plant corn, I'm going to go to Walmart and pick it up. <laughs> Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest. Some of you need to hear this. God's working, and you've been questioning. It's time to be patient and watch. You want it instant. I can't snap, but you want whatever it is instantly, right? God doesn't always do things in your instance. He does them in his. Love is patient. It's not jealous. It doesn't keep track of wrong. It's kind no matter the situation. In fact, it is so kind to others because it finds value in others. And it celebrates. Here he says in this scripture, he says it doesn't keep a record of the wrongs. In fact, it celebrates the rights. Do you know what we ought to be doing? We ought to be celebrating the wins of the people around us. We ought to be celebrating. When somebody else at work gets a promotion and you didn't, when somebody else gets a raise and you didn't, do you know the way that you might get a raise? Start celebrating that person and help them be successful because then you might get what you need or want or what you expect. By the way, so many of us expect to be handed things when God says you need to get up and work for it. I don't mind people getting a check from the government, but I hope that you deserve it. Because if you have a, a, the ability to work, get up off your chair, off your bed, go to work. The Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. There he goes to meddling again. I hear you. Love is patient and kind. Love also speaks the truth. Romans 8, 37, that, that's right before that don't separate or never, nothing separates us from God. Listen to this. No, despite over the, uh, all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. His love enables us to have victory. And it's time for us to celebrate the wins of others and the wins that God gives us. Why? By the way, we did that today. We talked about testimonies about coming to church. We talk about that in, in the life of how he's changed my life, how he gives me hope when there ain't another hope. Here's how God shows us his goodness. God's way of pointing others to him is through us as we are patient and kind, just like Paul saw in that verse. He said, I'm going to show you, but listen to what he said in Acts 16 or 17, 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Axton, Athens, not Axton. When God, Paul was waiting for them in Athens... He was deeply troubled by the idols he saw everywhere in the city. Leave that up, Holden. I'm troubled by what I see around us. I didn't vote for Mr. Biden, but Mr. Biden's my president. I didn't put the stuff on the shelf at the store, but it's there. Let, let, let me give you some thoughts. The world around me is being shaped by who's in charge of the world. And the prince and the power of the air is Satan. And we've been listening to him way too long. We've been celebrating his victories way too long. Can I remind you what God reminded him of? Oh, sir, you may crush his heel but he will crush your head. Satan's going to lose in the end. Y'all understand where I'm coming from? If you've never been in church before, let me explain that, okay? In the Garden of Eden, there was a, two people, Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve sinned. Eve first, but that's a different story. Adam and Eve sinned, right? And because they sinned, sin came to all of us. And at that point, God the Father, the creator of all, looked at the deceiver, Satan, and said, Satan, you can have a little bit of room here. I want to tell you, you're going to hurt us. And by the way, sin has killed us, hadn't it? Any, anybody have issues with, with your feet? You know, that um, bad toenail or neuropathy or what, uh, plantar fasciitis. That, ooh, that hurts, doesn't it? It's for a season because when I get to heaven, I'm going to have a beautiful body. I'm going to be seven feet tall and 191 pounds. <laughs> That's not the point. The point is this. He's in charge and I'm not. L l listen to what he said. When I look around and see this world, I'm troubled. Paul said, when I looked around Athens and I saw all the idols, listen, when I look around the church, sometimes I'm troubled. Anybody else? 
Listen, we're in the world and not of the world. I'm not telling you to wear suits and dresses. And I, I'm telling you, look to Jesus. Anybody okay? What is this? Love covers a multitude of wrong. 1 Peter 4, 8. I've said it several times this month. But it says, most importantly of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sins. Here's the deal. There is somebody that you don't like, that you're bitter with, that you're holding on to a grudge. And until you stop holding on to a grudge and start loving them, that sin is not going to get covered. He reminds us he is strong. Where I'm weak, he is strong. He reminds us of that. That's what love does. Where it really matters is this. By the way, did you know that you matter? Bobby Petroselli. You remember Bobby? The FCA guy? You matter. That's all he goes around telling everybody. You matter. You matter. You matter. You know what we ought to be doing to our kids and our neighbors and our friends? and We ought to be showing them that they matter. How many people are you walking by? You don't even see them. You don't even notice them because you have taken away all their value in your head. It's time to give people value. In fact, true love is this, doing for somebody else that can't do anything for you. Luke 12, 28, it says, And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow, thrown to the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? By the front, he, you matter. You matter to God. Look at your neighbor and say, you matter. There you go. Do you know what? I believe every day he wants to look at you and say, you matter. I love you, and I'm going to continue to love you. So here you go. Number one, we talked today about divine love. We secondly talked about do love. Here's the last part, the last one, and I want you to remember this forever. Don't give up. Y'all ready? Don't give up! Because we do. Almost daily. You know, I, I think one of the most important things we can do bless you, is to call each other out. You sat in my office this morning, you called me out. You did. I don't remember if you remember what it was, Michael, but you called me out on faith. And you did the same thing this morning at the breakfast table. Thank you. Have y'all talked to each other? Because when you see a brother or sister that is lost, not lost, but kind of lost their sight, call them out. Hey, he told us don't give up. He told us that he'd provide. He told us that he was going to give us the best. He, he told us that he's still coming back. He told us that he'll help us through the addiction. He told us that my son's going to be okay. He, he told us that I need to keep doing what he purposed me for. He, he told me that it, it's in his time, not in my time. Oh, God, please. You know what? He's the one. Don't give up. That's why he says here, what is faith? Real simple, verse number seven. Love never gives up, never loses faith, always hopeful, endures through every circumstance. So here you go. Faith is vital to igniting your love. If you don't believe in God, you're not having an opportunity or even the ability to love. You've got to believe in God. Love never loses faith. God always is love, and he's always building our faith. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, and 14. Be on guard. Stand firm in faith. Be courageous, be strong, and do everything with love. Why is this? Because God wants to continue to fill our tank. You ever gotten to empty on your car tank? Anybody? Anybody ever run out of gas? I think there are, <laughs> those of you who have never run out of gas, come ride with me. <laughs> Hadn't done it in a while, but it's happened. I had, had a truck when I was 17 that didn't have a gas gauge. I learned a lesson. About 200 miles, you better go get gas. Because it stalled right in the middle of an intersection and like a busy intersection. Have you ever let your life, your spiritual life run out of gas? We do it a lot. Don't give up. And one way not to give up is keep your fuel tank, your faith fuel tank, keep it. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Here's who our God is. We need to continue to, to fill that fuel tank, that spiritual fuel tank. Too many people have empty tanks. And just put a, my daddy always said, it, <laughs> when it gets to a fourth tank or gets to a half tank, fill it up. It's just as cheap to run up the top part than it is the bottom part. There you go. Don't wait. Well, I don't have any money. Well, here's the deal. Find it and go put gas in the car. But put, put, get, put gas, put spiritual gas. If you don't have anything to fill you up, I want to tell you about a man who wants to fill you to full. 
In fact, King David said it this way. My cup overruns. Did you notice that right around that same scripture, my cup overflows, is the verse that says, even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, my cup still overruns. Filled with hope. Isn't that that what he says here? He says, love never gives up, never loses faith. It is always, always hopeful. Filled with hope up with hope, filling others with hope, living hope-filled lives. Romans 8, 3 through 5. Listen carefully. It says, we can now rejoice when we run into problems and trials. For we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And strength of character or character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. He wants to fill us up. So in every, every, every day, fill up with Jesus. You ever feel like God moved out of your life? You ever feel like there's a distance between you and God? It's you that move, not him. Come unto me, all you who are, who, who are weary or burdened, and I'll give you rest. Can I remind you today that he endures, love endures every circumstance, but he endures. Why does love, and God is love. Can, can you say that with me? God is love. So how is it, answer this, that love endures every circumstance? Because God is love. What gets in the way of us knowing and and loving, knowing his love and loving others. What gets in the way, me? And then what reminds me of his love? Open your eyes. All around us are signs. Again, uh, Psalms chapter 8 this morning, the handiwork of God. Can you imagine what it must have been like on that special day of creation? Ah, I'm going to put a star there, star there, star there, star there. Oh, look at this. I'm going to connect them like a dipper. Anyway, I'm going to put a really big one right there in the north. I don't know how he did it. He may have just yawned, and there, and there it was. I, but he did it. Can I tell you this? That even when the clouds are in the sky, right behind him are the stars of the heavens. Even when life is difficult, right behind and even around that difficulty, there's God. His divine love is everlasting. We need to show others and do love, understanding that we cannot give up. Jude one twenty one, And await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love. Don't give up. Galatians 6, 9. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we do not give up. God's not giving up on you. Listen right here. God's not giving up on you. Who is it that he's told you today, don't give up on them? There's a lost and dying world around us that needs to see that the church hadn't given up on them. I'm in. How about you? Don't give up because God is love and he wants to use you and me to revolutionize this world. But it starts with me hearing a little voice. Up and down. Up and down. And I picked her up in my arms. Let Jesus pick you up today. And he may say something like we heard. That little girl say, I love you, G-Paw. Jesus loves you. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your, your opportunities, your day to remind us to not give up, to be loved and to love others. Thank you that no matter what, no matter what I did in the past, no matter where I am today, that you love me. And God, I pray that those within the sound of my voice right now would hear that voice inside them, I God says, I love you. 
You are valuable to me. You matter to me. Oh God, my God, I will seek you earnestly. When it seems dry out here, God, I'm going to seek you to fill up my life. God, we need you today. God, I need you today. God, I pray. I pray we would confess that we need you today. Thank you so much for your unending, <coughs> unconditional, beautiful love. Oh, how you love us. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves you just hear his voice right now I love you can you just hear his voice right now you go tell them go tell them that you love them because I loved you can you hear him today he may be speaking to your heart go forgive them or, or maybe he's speaking to your heart today I forgive you Maybe you've crawled into your own little life and you've cut off God. It's time to crawl out and let him embrace you. Because he says today, I love you. For God is love. And everyone who loves is a child of God. God, I thank you that the truth is you hate sin but you love the sinner. That's me. Help us to know that reality. Oh, how you love. Oh, how you love me, us. May we show others. May we accept ourselves in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with me? We'd love to spend some time praying.